The subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Again, good morning to everyone and welcome to today's hearing on the rise in violence against minority institutions. I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list to circulate exhibits, motions or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. Your vital information is important to the historical record of this committee hearing. I would also ask all members to please mute your microphones when you're not speaking uh, to uh, the hearings business. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today's hearing on the rise in violence against minority institutions will continue uh, this subcommittee's inquiry uh, into domestic terrorism and investigate the rise in attacks directed against minority institutions and places of worship across the nation. For too many years now, every ethnic group in the United States has been touched by the increase in domestic terrorism and hate crimes, many in the tragic form of mass shootings. I know that if I opened up uh, this uh, moment uh, to members, uh, each of my members uh, on this committee might cite some incident in their community. Just recently in Harris County, Northeast Atasca Cedar and Northwest Cypress, anti-Semitic and racist uh, messages were posted at the doors of homeowners. It's everywhere. These tragedies and their circumstances are all too familiar to each of us. The shooting spree at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, which left 22 dead and 24 more injured. The rampage at Philadelphia's Tree of Life Synagogue, where 11 people were killed. The racist attack on the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin, which left six people dead. The brutal murder of nine worshipers in the Emanuel African and Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Three Muslim college students executed in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, supposedly over parking, but tinged with hostility to the young people's look. And the spa shoot in Atlanta killed eight people, including six women of Asian descent. In each instance, the perpetrator had previously exposed, espoused racist and xenophobic beliefs against minorities. Last year, this subcommittee held a hearing on the rise of domestic terrorism in America to discuss the surge of white supremacy and right-wing extremism and to discuss federal law enforcement's failure to address domestic terrorism and acts of violence driven by racially motivated hate uh, and of course, animus toward religious minorities. It appears that trends have not changed um, and the rise in violence continues. Once again, we watched in horror on January 15th of this year as a gunman stormed into a synagogue, this time in Colleyville, uh, Texas, taking four people hostage and holding them for almost 12 hours. Miraculously and in part due to training, the congregation received following other anti-Semitic attacks, those who were held hostage managed to escape, uh, including under the leadership of their rabbi. Then as Black History Month began, more than 20 historically Black colleges and universities across the country uh, became the targets of repeated bomb threats, even starting as early as January, which paralyzed these vital institutions of higher education, disrupting learning by forcing them to suspend classes, striking fear in the hearts of young students, faculty and staff, parents in the communities that surround and support them, reopening wounds of, these, uh, of those who recall the threats, bombings, burnings and lynchings of the not too distant past. We have to take these threats to young people and institutions of learning, minority institutions, very, very seriously. Because what is a threat uh, be can become devastation tomorrow. What is a threat today can become devastation tomorrow. The threats which began in January, including at Prairie View AMM uh, University, not far from my district in Prairie View, Texas, intensified in frequency in February, and the number of schools targeted uh, grew in number uh, by the day. Howard University, which sits not far from this nation's capital, had received at least five bomb threats in the past two months, the most recent being communicated on Monday. This is unacceptable. At least one caller claimed to be affiliated with a violent neo-Nazi group 
known to have participated in the racist Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, which resulted in the barbaric death of Heather Heyer. Both the FBI and ATF are currently investigating the bomb threats as they should, which limits uh, the amount of information we can receive or discuss. However, we do know these crimes are being investigated as racially motivated. And we look to soon having full investigations by both the FBI and the ATF. Threats of violence and intimidation against minority institutions are intended to incite fear and anxiety among diverse communities are deeply rooted in the fabric of the United States history. Let it be very clear that attacks on students and institutions are attacks on communities and families and uh, surrounding areas. In the turbulent years of post-Civil War reconstruction, at least 2,000 Black people were lynched, along with thousands who were harassed, beaten, and threatened simply because they chose to live as they should as free men and women. When Reconstruction ended, Southern states regained control of their governments and enacted Jim Crow laws that legalized discrimination, with many elected officials being members of the Ku Klux Klan, making white supremacy the law of the land. During this same period, Chinese immigrants endured hateful acts of racism as white workers began to see them as competition, first for gold and later for scarce jobs. Racism and xenophobia against Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, led to the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which banned Chinese laborers from entering the United States for 10 years and prohibited Chinese immigrants already here from becoming citizens. By 1924, the United States had taken steps to shut down nearly all immigration from Asia and to enact a quota system that severely restricted immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. In the 1920s and 1930s, the Klan maintained its anti-Black doctrines added to its vile rhetoric on anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic tenants, all in the name of white supremacy and racial purity. The Klan maintained a strong foothold in politics and continued harassing and killing African-Americans with impunity. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, more than 4,084 uh, 4, racially motivated lynchings occurred in 12 Southern states between 1887 and 1950. As African-Americans struggled for equal rights under the law, the Klan murdered and threatened civil rights workers, bombed churches, and beat and spat upon nonviolent protesters like Congressman John Lewis and the Freedom Riders. By 1975, Klan members had bombed almost 70 buildings in Georgia and Alabama, burned 30 black churches in Mississippi, murdered 10 people in Alabama. Sadly, the views and acts of hate committed by white supremacists reverberate throughout American history. We still hear their echoes today as men holding tiki torches march and chant, Jews will not replace us. When members of the Proud Boys, a far right organization identified by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group and classified by the FBI as having white nationalist ties, burn Black Lives Matter flags in front of two historically black churches, in the nation's capital, we remember uh, the burning crosses placed in yards as warnings. And when young black scholars are threatened with the possibility of bombings, we remember four little girls who died when that church, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham was bombed in 1963. These racist beliefs of the past are taking hold uh, and again, threatening our places of refuge and safety, such as HBCUs, churches, synagogues, and temples which renewed fervor in the new ways. We cannot allow this to continue. Extremist ideology is not abstract danger. It harms Americans from a wide swath of backgrounds, including our frontline law enforcement officers, and we never know when or where it will strike again. We salute their service, especially those who made the ultimate sacrifice in keeping our communities safe from domestic extremist terrorism. And we're reminded of January 6th and the brave uh, law enforcement officers who stood the guard to protect us, to protect the United States and protect the Citadel of Democracy. FBI Director Christopher Wray declared that 2019 was the deadliest year for domestic extremist violence since the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. In 2020, the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Program reported 8,263 hate crimes, including 11,129 offenses. Of these incidents, 62% were motivated by racial or ethnic bias 20% were motivated by bias against persons' sexual orientation. 13% were motivated by victims' religion. However, the FBI's reporting of hate crimes is thought to be a severe undercount since it relies on local law enforcement 
to voluntary submit data, we must do better to collect the data and act upon it. The federal government possesses vast statutory authorities and resources to prevent attacks, prosecute those who commit them, fortify targeted institutions from further attacks, and arm citizens with the knowledge of how to protect themselves. Yet we are failing the American people who do not do more to face this threat. The Bipartisan Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, of which I'm a co-sponsor, is one measure that would strengthen the federal government's effort to respond to domestic terrorism. This legislation would authorize the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, and the FBI to analyze, investigate, monitor, and prosecute domestic terrorism jointly, promote information sharing among federal law enforcement agencies, and take preventative measures, focusing federal resources on the most significant threats. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished guest uh, witnesses who will speak directly to the continuing violence, threats of violence, and trauma being inflicted upon minority communities across this country. Fear cannot be an option in this nation. Healing must be. We must bring people together and we must pass legislation uh, here in the United States Congress to be signed by the president that helps to heal the nation and protect the nation as well from the scourge of domestic terrorism. I hope that our discussion today will lead us to solutions that address the deficiencies in our domestic terrorism strategy to keep all Americans race. We must get to the bottom of racial antagonisms and as well as religious antagonisms and others that keep us separated. Without objection, I will submit into the record the following documents, an op-ed by our colleague, Congressman Waisi Infumi, entitled, Terrorists Won't Stop Our HBCUs. Representative Infumi is an alumnus of Morgan State and also represents Morgan State, which sits in his district. He has also served as chairman of the board of regents at the university for over a decade and has expressed to me his deep concern for the attacks on HBCUs and has really contributed in his request uh, to this hearing. We thank him very much for his leadership uh, and we look forward to working with him even though he's not a member of this committee. A joint letter from the United Negro College Fund and the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, written testimony from the Muslim advocates, a letter from the American Council on Education, a letter from the National Action Network. We'll have all of these uh, submitted into the record without objection. I now recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Owens, for his opening statements. Mr. Owens, welcome. Thank you very much. 